Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Rachel Abbott. Hi Rachel. Hi Joanna. Well, it's super exciting to have you on the show. Just a little introduction. Rachel Abbott is the internationally best-selling author of six crime thriller novels, including the recent Kill Me Again. In August 2015, Amazon revealed that Rachel is the UK's best-selling independent author over the last five years and is listed at number 14 in the list of UK best-selling authors both traditional and indie, which is super exciting, uh, outselling authors like Jeffrey Archer and Jojo Moyes, which is amazing. And Rachel, I'm so pleased to have you on the show. You're like a superstar. Oh, God. <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> no, no, but you are. But what's great is you were first on the show back in 2012. And your first book, Only the Innocent, came out and reached the top of the UK charts. Um, but I wondered if you could give us an update, like, you know, going back to that first book four, over four years ago. Um, what has changed in your writing career? And, you know, give us an update. So much has changed. I can't believe it's actually four years ago. I can still remember sitting out because I was actually in Italy when you did the last one. And now, of course, I'm in Alderney. So I do now I spend part of my time in Italy and part of my time in Alderney. So that's one change because I'd never even heard of Alderney four years ago. <laughs> and now I live here. So, <laughs> and, and for people who don't know, what is Alderney? Oh, Alderney is a tiny island in the Channel Isles. It's close to Guernsey. And um, if there's only 2,000 people on the island and it's full of white sandy beaches and turquoise seas and a lot of people who like to party. <laughs> so it's a great place to live. <laughs> it is. Um, and so what else has changed? Well, oh, loads. So since I spoke to you, I don't know when, I, when it bounced in 2012 it was that I spoke to you. But since then, I, I've got an agent, which is the best decision I ever made. Mm. I've written four more full-length novels and one novella. Um, my books have been now published in over 20 languages <sighs> worldwide. I know, I know, I'm just absolutely amazed by that. That's just fantastic. And I've sold over two million copies. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And, and so it's been pretty good, really. It has been pretty good. And and to be sort of in the top 15 of all UK authors. Oh, that was just amazing. I mean, it was nice to hear that I was the number one independently published author. That's always a really great thing to know. But to know that I was so high up in the list of of all writers, including some of my favourites who weren't even there, I thought, oh, my goodness. Of course, that is on the Kindle, you know. Mm. I mean, that's, that's not... Um, it's not paperback sales and things like that, obviously. That's not an... I do sell paperbacks, but not in the quantities that you'd expect from, you know, one of the traditionally published authors. Mm. So. And, I mean, you mentioned you have uh, an agent and yet you, you know, you're in these multiple languages, but are you still an indie, just so people know, or how are you publishing? Yes, I am. Uh, definitely independently published. Um, apart from the foreign language ones, they're published by um, traditional publishers all over the world. Um, but in the UK, I'm entirely um, independently published. And in the States, my first two books um, are published traditionally, but I didn't go ahead with that for the subsequent books because they were looking for world English rights and I was, wasn't prepared to give up my UK rights. So unfortunately, um, decided that that was more important to me. So even though I've got an agent, I am still independently published. Yeah, fantastic. I just wanted everyone to know that because some people yes. think that as soon as you become, as soon as you hit number one on Amazon or you get in the charts, like you sign with an agent, you go traditional and that's it. But you're a businesswoman, right? Yeah, and my agent is very savvy, very smart lady. In fact, she's agent of the year this year. Ah. Um, so she's very smart and um, she's guided me all the way through. Um, obviously, after Only the Innocent, there was a possibility I could have signed with a, a traditional or um, traditional publisher. And she said, well, I think you should do one or two more, really, just to build your name, build your profile. And then that would maybe make it easier to find the right match for you in terms of a publisher. And so we've worked together and we discuss all the time which is the right route to go. I'm not against traditional publishing mm. in any way, shape or form. Um, but at the moment, this has been working for me, so... Yeah. With what works, really. Yeah, that's fantastic. And then I remember when you were on the show, you said, I mean, you published that first book without having it edited, right? You... No. <laughs> so how has your writing process changed and what, oh, you, you know, your writing craft? 
Oh, so much. I mean, I didn't have it. I had it proofread, obviously, and a lot of people don't really understand the difference between editing and proofreading. And I don't think I did, if I'm honest. I think that I thought um, an editor did the proofreading and then if they thought anything wasn't very good, they changed it. I don't <laughs> I don't know where I got that idea from. Anyway, um, Only the Innocent, which was my first book, that after I got an agent, it was subsequently edited. And when I saw what an editor does and how they change, they, they don't change things, but they recommend things for you to do and how you might change something, it was a revelation, to be honest. So now my writing is very different now. So now I put together a synopsis of what I'm going to write and I send that to my agent who says, yeah, but what about this? And do you think this is the right age for the protagonist? And um, do you think that there's going to be a big enough twist at the end of it? And she asks me all these questions, which make me sort of want to <laughs> slip my throat. You know? <laughs> oh, I've not thought of that. I've not thought of that. It can be quite, you know, it's quite, um, you've got to be fairly tough, I think, in this life. And so when I've written the first about 20,000 words, I send her that and she then comments on that, which sometimes results in me completely rethinking, to be honest. Sometimes, mostly doesn't, occasionally it does. And um, and then when I finish the whole thing, it goes off to her and she reads it and she has a reader who's also an editor and she comes in. And so it's read by about six people and comments fed back to me at all kinds of levels. And then I pay for a copy editor and a proofreader. So it's a much, much longer process now. Mm. It's not a case of writing it and sticking it up on the Kindle. <laughs> Although that that did you know did work for you the first time around, but I think you know me. yeah no worries. Um, so one of the other things that I I love having people back on the show since you know the show's been running years now since two thousand and nine, um, and what's great is you know you and I have both seen people come into the industry, write a book, disappear. Um, you've you know just gone up and up. Um, what do you think keeps you growing and producing great books? What keeps the customers coming back, basically? Because so many authors seem to have, like, you know, the people who have a one hit might not make it on the second hit. But, you know, you seem to be really consistent. So what is it, do you think, that m keeps people coming back? I think that although the books are different, they're all very different, they're completely different stories, um, although I've got a, a series character in Tom Douglas, who's the policeman, he's never the main character. So a lot of people don't actually realise that. A lot of people think he is the main character, but he isn't. Um, all of my books tend to have the need of a policeman, so therefore he's the same one who comes up over and over again. But the stories aren't about him. They're about people who are perhaps similar to my own readers who've got dilemmas and, you know, what would you do if you were put in this set of circumstances or if you found out that your husband was a killer, what would you do? And and so there are lots of, of scenarios that I hope that people can relate to. And I think that quite often if you've got a series character who is the main protagonist sometimes the books can be quite similar mm. because that that character is similar um but although i've got him the the main characters the main protagonists of my story are all quite different with very different dilemmas i'm hoping that's what makes it work <laughs> Well, that is, it is a really good point because I've read uh, three of your books, I think. I haven't read them all, but I've read three. And I did notice this guy's come back again, but he's not the main character. And yeah. I did actually actively notice that. But until you said that, I hadn't thought that that would make the books more original and seem more standalone. But I think you're right. That's actually... Is, is, can you, are there any other writers who do that? I'm just trying to think. I, do you know, I actually don't know. There are quite a lot of writers who I love, people like Val McDermott, Sharon Bolt and people like that who have series characters and quite often write books that haven't got those characters mm. in. So Val McDermott with Tony Hill and Carol Jordan and Sharon Bolton with Lacey Flint. But she's just written a completely standalone one now. It's got So they quite often have standalone books as well as their series characters. Mm. Um, but mainly people who've got series characters, as far as I can work out, they are mainly... Mm -hmm. The, the the protagonist and mine isn't yeah oh there we go there's a trick 
<laughs> I, I, it wasn't intentional. I'd like to say that it was a very clever move, but actually it was not intentional at all. Oh, I love it. Um, and then that that's what keeps, well, maybe what, what keeps the readers coming back. What keeps you inspired? Because many people are like, oh, if I only hit the charts or if I only sold this many books, then, you know, maybe I'd, I'd have made it. What keeps you coming back and writing more? Um, the readers, really. I mean, they're so enthusiastic. They're so amazing. Um, they, I, the number of messages that I get um, on Facebook, on Twitter, emails, all kinds of things. And they're so enthusiastic. When's the next book? When's the next book? And I feel that I owe them that, really. I think that that's one of the things. And also, of course, I love writing. I love telling stories. So, you know, those are the two things really that drive So the other thing I wanted to know uh, is what has changed in terms of how you market a book? Because, um, you know, when we talked, uh, you know, back in 2012, it seemed like your first book, you really focused on um, book bloggers, for example. Like, you, yeah. yeah, we really talked about that. And you had gone very hard in relationships with book bloggers and pitching them. And, you know, so uh, how has your marketing changed? You know, what what has stopped working? King, um, and what what does work now? Well, let yeah, just at start, and we'll discuss it. Okay. <laughs> there were too many questions there. Okay. okay, so I used to. I think with only the innocent, I spent quite a lot of time on forums. Mm. So they just started the Amazon Meet Our Authors forum, and I found on that forum there were lots of people like me who were writing maybe their first book, maybe not their first book, but they were just getting into writing for the Kindle. And everybody used to share. You know, everybody used to pass around stuff. Have you read this book by such and such a person? And people talked about it. And um, that's changed a lot now. I think if you go onto most of these forums a lot of the people are just other authors who just cut and paste the next ad for their next book and then they move off. People don't seem to to talk to each other in the same way. Because I can remember with Only the Innocent, when it really started to go up the charts very, very quickly, I put something on a forum saying, I don't know what's happening, it's suddenly going berserk, which was lovely. Um, and somebody responded, I check out this forum. And I went to a forum and people were talking about it. So it wasn't the Meet Our Authors Forum, but somebody from the Meet Our Authors, Authors Forum, God, that's a mouthful, <laughs> Authors Forum, um, had gone on and promoted my book in another, you know, as, as a reader. And that had really helped, but that doesn't seem to work anymore. Um, yeah. So I, I, but I still, with the book bloggers, I still send copies of my books for review to book bloggers. We have a database of um, of reviewers and we send them a, a very, um, almost like what I think the publishers call an AI sheet, which is uh, all the information that you might need, an author's information sheet with in, um, a picture of the cover, the, the blurb for the story, a bit of detail about how many books I've sold. So I get quite a lot of people prepared to review it based on that. Mm. And so on the forums, I mean, I would say now that was probably been mainly replaced by Facebook groups. Yes. Um, so how are you using Facebook? Because really in 2012, we weren't using Facebook to market books. I mean, maybe we weren't even on Facebook. I can't remember. But um, how, so how has that changed? Um, I use Facebook. Um, I, I always think with Facebook, I have more success than anything, even though I've probably only got about four and a half thousand followers on Facebook and 10,000 on Twitter. But on Facebook, there's about four and a half thousand, but they are really um, keen and enthusiastic. And, you know, I can put out a, a post and, and I can see that it's been seen by maybe three and a half thousand people and shared. And as you know, if you've got a Facebook page and you post on it, on average, it's only seen by about 4% mm. of the people who actually um, uh, like your page because that's the way Facebook works and they want you to promote the page, which, of course, we do. Um, but, you know, not always. But sometimes it just happens. Sometimes it's just kind of people are interested and they share. And that's brilliant. Um, and so I use Facebook I don't post on it all the time, um, but I do when I've got anything that I think people might be interested in. And the other thing that I do is I always, when I'm launching a new book, I always have a Facebook party. Now, people think this is a really weird thing to do because why would anybody want to go to a party on Facebook? 
But we put a huge, huge amount of effort into the Facebook parties. Every single post is planned so that there's something for the people watching to join in on. So it might be a competition, it might be upload a picture. So we had one this year about um, the, the pose for a dead body or something. You wouldn't believe the number of people who had pictures of themselves posing as a dead body. <laughs> It was just hysterical, honestly. It was such good fun. And we give lots of prizes and we have, I was going to say goodie bags, but we call them baddie bags, obviously. Um, and so, but that's really, that's not really a promotion. That's really to say thanks to the people who have been so committed and following all the time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I think the, the best thing in terms of promotion is the mailing list. You know, having a decent mailing list of people who have, shown that they already like your books and they've chosen to join your mailing list that i think makes a big difference yeah and, and what, there are lots of people know that you should have a mailing list you should build your facebook group etc but a lot of fiction authors in particular don't know what to share so there are some great examples there of things that you do on on promotion you know launch day but what type of things are you sharing with your email list or with your facebook group or page at, on a normal level like between books what, what are you sharing then well, any well, i share any um uh, any promotions so if we've got any books that are on special offers I share that obviously because it gives people an opportunity to buy them usually for 99p so people do tend to appreciate that um, so I share information I share bits if I've been on some really nice holiday and stuff because because the readers I, I don't share what I've had for dinner and what I've had for breakfast you know but I, if I've been somewhere quite interesting and exotic so people can be quite interested in they never pictures of me. I hate pictures of me with a passion. So I just share pictures of birds and things, you know. <laughs> um, but I do that. But the, the more important thing, really, is the with the newsletter that I send out to people who have joined my newsletter list, my mailing list. So we do, we're starting to do a monthly newsletter now. We used to do it more, less regularly than that. But we do a monthly newsletter, but it's not all about me because I don't think they just want to know about me. So I read a lot, as you might expect. So I usually am do, starting doing review of up to about four books that I've read. I only write positive reviews. So if, if I don't like it, it doesn't go in the list. We've got competitions on there and lots of things for people to engage with, really. We quite often put competitions on Facebook as well. Mm. So there's stuff like that for people to get involved in. Um, I think at the moment we've got some a competition to win free um, audible downloads and stuff like that so there's usually something that we can think of that will engage people yeah and I'm on your list and I just got your thing about um oh, the newsletter yeah yeah right. book reviews I do book reviews too and I agree with you that I think this is something that you realize when you become an author to only post good reviews because you can really piss off people that you end up meeting right I, I won't do it. I will never ever. So I get, because I'm very fortunate now, I get sent quite a lot of books by publishers to read and comment on. And I will never comment positively on a book that I don't like. Mm -hmm. I just say, I'm sorry, I've not had time to read it or something. Um, I will only comment positively because I don't think there's anything to be gained by being negative about people who are competitors. I just don't think it's the right thing to do. Because I don't like it doesn't mean it's not a good book. It means that it just didn't work for me. Exactly. So, and I think it's it's so important with the, the world we live in as well, because um, you do tend to meet other authors over the years. And, of course. And then it's like, oops. <laughs> So yeah, be careful. Um, so I was I was wondering there, um, you know, just on the mailing list. So how do you continue to build your mailing list? What what are your pro is it just that in the back of your book it says join my mailing list, or do you do anything uh, advertising wise? Uh, the the most important is the, is the one in the back of the book. So in the back of each Kindle book, there's a link. So if you click on it, it takes you to a website where you can fill in the details. And I get new people every single day signing up to that list. And they're the best. So, yes, I do some of the Facebook advertising stuff, the thing that's been, I mean, a lot of people do that very successfully. And I did, and I got a lot of names on my list, which was great. But they'd all signed up for something free. And so um, what I do now is when I send out anything at all, I have kept the list separate. So I've got a list of the people who have actually mm. 
joined because they've enjoyed my books and I've got the list of people who've joined because there was something free that they were getting. And the difference between the res in the response rates between the two is quite extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So the people who have actually joined up because they want to read my books, the response rate, the, the click-through rate, and the open rate is so much better than the other one. So although I'll still do the rest of it, I'll still do the the Facebook adverts to get people to come on board because it's still very useful. The actual, um, the quality of the leads that you get through that is not as good as the leads that you get through people actually liking your books. Mm, no, fantastic. And then just coming back to the um, book bloggers, um, uh, one thing that's been open, opened up to indies is NetGalley, which traditional yes. publishers have used. Um, and on NetGalley, of course, uh, book bloggers can get ebook versions of traditionally published books. You know, it used to all be hardback. Um, now, so I, two questions. One, do you do ebook and paperback uh, arcs for reviewers? And secondly, what do you think about NetGalley? So, in terms of do I do. Uh paperbacks yes i do so they can get ebooks or paperbacks so i usually have a print on demand version of the paperback done very quickly um so that that's available um as an advanced copy for mainly some bloggers but a lot of them are quite happy with an ebook but my i've got a pr agent now a publicist and she sends out books to the mainstream reviewers and they will only take a book and mm. um, so she sends them to reviewers and she also sends them to magazines and um, festival organisers, things like anybody who she thinks might be interested. In terms of NetGalley, I haven't used it. And I think part of the reason I haven't used it is because I don't really know properly how it works. My understanding is that lots of people can actually download with... Um, uh, but according to my publicist, she says that she would get the requests and then she could decide whether to let people have them or not, mm -hmm. which is fine, but I'm not quite sure how people would react if you said, no, you're not having one. <laughs> is, that, <Yeah. laughs> is that kind of the equivalent of giving a bad review? No, I'm not giving one to you. You know, it's, it's almost offensive, isn't it? to be honest yeah no i i understand and I, I i've seen things in facebook groups again with people getting offended and and this type of thing so it, it is a very uh, careful space to step around um but i wonder i mean you mentioned their publicist um uh, and of course we're indie authors but we, we don't do everything ourselves do we uh, you mentioned your agent um uh, i believe you have more than one virtual assistant one or more I have a virtual assistant and a personal assistant and a personal assistant so They're both part-time so can you maybe talk about how how what does your role look like in your business now and um are there any other people that might be useful to mention in terms of what they do for you that how do how does how do those tasks go to them so that you can do the writing well my personal assistant comes into the office twice maybe three times a day um, and when she's not here she uses a piece of software called sprout social so she goes on and checks all my twitter list to see which ones i need to respond to um, if people have um, retweeted things she thanks everybody i really wouldn't have time to do that it takes her about an hour and a half a day seven days a week she tends to do it on a saturday and a sunday as well I've not asked her to do that, can I just point out? <laughs> but she says she'd rather do that than do three hours of it on a Monday morning, <laughs> mm -hmm. which I kind of understand. So she does that, but she also, she comes into the office and there's nearly always some books to be sent out to people, um, so she deals with all of that. Um, she does... Um, she proofreads any of my online question and answer things because I get an awful lot of interviews. So I write them quickly. She proofs them. She used to be an editor. So mm -hmm. so, so she um, edits them and makes them make sense and gets rid of any garbage that I've written. You know, she's just sort of madly typing away and trying to get as much as you can on. Um, she manages the accounts to send to the accountant. Mm -hmm. Um, and so she and that, she does lots of everything you'd expect a PA to do, really. Um, and then my virtual assistant, who is in Canada, who you know well, is a complete star. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's well. both of ours, both of our virtual assistants. Yes, she is. <laughs> and she's fantastic because she's quite technical. So she can manage the blog and she can manage the, the um, databases and she can do a lot of that technical stuff. So we're redesigning the blog at the moment and I've done some work on the design. And then I just sent her the content and she puts it up there as the categories and stuff. I think people 
need to kind of appreciate that if you are a self-published author and you do become reasonably successful, there's a huge amount of stuff to do. My desk is a tip. I wish I could point this down. It is absolutely covered, <laughs> covered in stuff because there is so much that comes through the door all the time. Well, not through the door and obviously um, online as well, but there's a massive amount of stuff to do. Mm. So, you know, it does take takes quite a bit of managing. Yeah, and I think that the more successful you are, the more you get those requests, right? Because, yes. you know, I, I get more requests for Joanna Penn than JF Penn. I would like more for JF Penn. But it is, you know, I, I totally get what you're saying. There's loads of it. But people at the beginning often can't imagine why you would have that much to do. Um, you know, and why don't you just write? So wh what do you enjoy? I mean, because this is the other thing I wanted to ask you. Do you think anyone can do this job? Um, or what are the skills that you need to do this job? So I think that's a really tricky question. I think that you have to be prepared to work very hard. I think that's that is fundamental to it. You have to be able to put in the hours and enjoy it because there's no point doing it if it's going to be a complete slog. Um, but I would say that roughly half of my time is spent on admin, even though I've got a personal assistant, a virtual assistant, a publicist mm -hmm. and an agent mm -hmm. and an accountant. But, you know, in spite of that, I still spent about 50% of my time. So this week alone, I will probably have done five interviews, um, mainly not like this one. This is easy. I like these. These are easy because I can just talk to you. I'm just talking to Joe, so that's great. But um, the ones that actually uh, question and answers that I have to type up, I don't. I, I enjoy doing them. It's not an issue. But they all take time, and um, and then the sales figures come in from the agency. You've got to check through all those and make sure that that they all are what you're expecting them to be. And so there's just there is an endless stream of stuff to do. Um, particularly when you're dealing with foreign transactions as well because you get the contracts in, which I, I have to say I never read any of them. I just trust my agents have got it right. So <laughs> I just sign them, but they've got to be signed, initialed on every page. And so it's just there is just a sort of constant stream of, of admin stuff. And any time we've got any special offers on, we make a big effort about publicising that to let people know. So my PA then will design loads of tweets that she um sets up to come up at different times and there's just you know it's just endless really it, it, it is and i agree with you it, it is a full-time business it's like a small business in a way because we don't have loads of employees or anything but no. it, but it is a kind of all-encompassing life i think it really is is a life and i wondered how it does compare with your previous life in business because you've been a businesswoman for a long yes. time how does being an author compare with your previous businesses in terms of yeah, just everything. Um, so it's more fun. Mm. So I did enjoy, I enjoyed my life running a business, but I had at one time about 100 staff. So that brings its own headaches. And all I did then was manage. I didn't do anything. I didn't actually produce anything. Mm. I just managed. Um, and so that, that was, had its own rewards. But it, this is much more fun. Much more fun. And my PA is an editor, as I said, or was an editor, but she's now a writer and is very, very funny. So we, when she's in, we do we have quite a good laugh. But there's just two of us. So I don't have to deal with a load of traumas of, you know, all the kind of HR things that I used to have to deal with and, and then going to board meetings and having to produce board reports. It used to make me laugh, really, that, you know, if you say effectively you work 20 days a month, one day you'd be preparing a board report, one one day you would be um, actually at the board meeting. That's two days out of 20. That's a pretty significant amount of time reporting on what you're doing. <laughs> so there was an awful lot of that game. And, you know, so it's much better to be being creative. Even when I'm doing the blog, I'm being creative. Yeah, and I think that's the most important thing for people to remember is business is creative, right? Yes. All of it. So it's not just the putting words into a document for a story. It's everything else the, that makes up the author's life. Yes, that's right. Yeah. That's the whole thing. Yeah. So think all the time about what, what next you're going to do that readers are going to enjoy. You know, you're doing it for the readers. 
Mm, super. Now, I did want to ask you because, um, as you said, you've sold over two million books and, uh, you know, you're just one of the top people in England, uh, in the UK, sorry. And um, But in The Guardian, uh, there was an article in March, um, you said you still deal with snobbery as an indie author. So I was really interested about that. How are things different than 2012? Can I just say that The Guardian do tend to invent their own headlines? Oh, okay. That's exactly what I said. They've done it before. The last one that they wrote, the headline was something like, my success is all down to me, which is not what I said at all. <laughs> what I said is, if it all goes wrong, it's all down to me. So success or fail, as a self-published author, you've got nobody else to blame, is what I was trying to say. But, of course, they use that as a headline. Oh, my goodness me. I couldn't believe it. So... But it is true that there are still some people out there who believe, firmly believe, that I'm self-published because nobody will publish my books. And I would like to think and I would like to believe that maybe if I wanted to publish her now with the track record that I've got, that that would be possible. Um, and it has been suggested to me more than once that it is possible. <laughs> but they, nobody, there are certain people who just don't get it that we actually, some of us, remain self-published because we want to. I'm not saying I'll always remain self-published. I think there's lots to be said for being with a traditional publisher. And the time might come when actually all this other stuff that I have to do, I will be just so happy to hand it over to somebody. Um, but um, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, um, that's been my choice. But there are still some people out there who, A, feel, I think, maybe maybe irritated by the fact that some self-published authors are doing very well um, and maybe their books aren't doing so well. Um, and, and that must be pretty galling, really. If they've got a traditional deal, they've been through all the process, somebody's signed them up and they're still not selling very many copies. So that must be quite galling. And so I think that's why maybe some people can be a bit, oh, you're just self-published. Yeah, and it's, it's funny that, I mean, you know, we both know quite a lot of traditionally published authors as as friends, and it, it it always surprises me how uh, little people are actually earning um, in the traditional industry. And even when you th in the charts, they might be quite high up in the UK charts, for example. But the reality is that the numbers of books sold are, are quite low in in general. So, do you see um, on the on the flip side? Do you know and no 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 names or anything? But do people approach you from the other? Angle? and go hey Rachel you know maybe tell me about being indie I, I don't want my publisher to know but are people asking you uh, on the sly yes yes they are um I've met a very well-known author recently on a I, I tend to every now and again take myself off to some kind of spa place somewhere you know where I can be starved because when I'm working and when I'm when I'm really struggling I tend to eat biscuits <laughs> which you know takes its toll so every now and again I take myself off to somewhere like the Mayo Clinic in Austria or somewhere like that and I'm, I've met there um, a couple of authors one of whom is very well known and was actually been nominated for a Man Booker Prize so really good and he said to me what do I have to do to make money because I'm not making any with my publishers and I said oh, well I don't really know how to answer that because uh, it depends on the kinds of books. His are very literary books, mm -hmm. and and it's a completely different ball game, really. You know, I, the, my books are commercial books. They're books that can be read by anybody. Um, his books are, are very specific to a certain type of reader, so it is difficult. But even some of the the people who write commercial fiction have as, asked me. But then when I tell them the truth about what it entails. They run for the hills, you know, oh, my God, I can't do all that. And I don't blame them either. I started there, so I, it's easy for me to carry on. But to change from having everything done for you and to then start to have to do everything for yourself, I think that's a much more difficult transition. Mm. No, you're right. And it was funny, I was reading about James Patterson, who, of course, actually has his whole department at the publisher. Oh, yeah. You know, like 20 people working for him, even though they're within the publisher. You know, he pretty much runs a department of people. Yeah. And But I think, you know, there's that level. Um, even if you went into a publisher at this point, it's unlikely you would have a whole team. I mean, you would still only get a publicist in the month of publication i mean i i still believe well most people seem to say that authors have to do the marketing regardless of how they're published and that's why some of those people you know are just not 
getting anywhere because the publishers aren't doing it and the authors aren't doing it either. Yeah, I think that's true, actually. I think a lot of people think that their publishers should be doing it, so they don't do it. Yeah. And um, and I don't think that's necessarily the case, as you say, and they do get publicists for mm. a reasonably narrow period of time. I originally took my publicist on for six months, but I've kept her on all year because she's ace. <laughs> she's really good. And, um, and she's not busy all the year round, but when she is busy, she's really busy, so it works out very well. Mm. But I, it must be frustrating to only have somebody for a week or a month or something. So just on the publicist, because some people think that that is the answer, with people who think that they want a publicist, I mean, it's not an insignificant expense. What no. can what can people expect from a publicist and um, who does it suit, basically? The thing about PR is it's very difficult to quantify the returns from PR. So if your publicist managed to get you get you a speaking engagement at um, a festival, A, you probably won't get paid. Um, I Sometimes I get offered the money, but if it's a charitable thing, I always um, waive my fee anyway. So you're not doing, you're not doing it for money. Um, and how many books will you realistically sell? Mm. So you've got to work out why you're doing it. And the reason why um, why I want a publicist is because I want people to have heard of my name. And it is very difficult to define what the returns from that will be. But if somebody's on Amazon and they see my book and they think, oh, I've heard of Rachel Abbott, I might give that a try. And it's it's as vague as that. You know, obviously she does quite a lot of stuff getting reviews and gets me lots of articles in magazines and stuff. But again, you know, if you look at the sales figures, just because I got a brilliant review in Good Housekeeping magazine, there was no obvious rise in sales for that day. Mm. But that's what PR is all about. It's about building up awareness of who you are and of people knowing who you are and having heard of you. So you're constantly trying to get your name and your book cover in front of people so that when they do see it somewhere, when they are out to buy something, yours is the first one that springs to mind. Um, it is hard to quantify. And so I would say that for newbie authors or people without a, a budget, that n hiring a, a publicist is, is not... A, Waste of time. Yeah, no, not a good start. OK, so we're, we're almost coming to the end, but I wonder, um, you know, looking forward, I hope it won't be four years until I have you back on the show. <laughs> but if you think about, you know, I mean, that would be 2020. I mean, do you... I know, scary stuff. Do you have, you know, what what are your ambitions? You know, when you've sold this many books and you've hit this these charts and everything, um, do you have writing ambitions or is it, uh, you know, is it more lifestyle ambitions or what are you looking to do in the next four years? <clears throat> it's a big That's question. A, thanks, Joe. <laughs> what am I looking to do? I, I want to write even better books. I want them to get better and better and better. It's really important to me that I feel as if each time I write, I'm getting better at my craft. Not necessarily the stories any better because sometimes, you know, sometimes the early stories are better than the more recent ones and vice versa. Um, but it's more about me getting better at writing. So that's really important to me. Um, but apart from that, I just want to keep on writing, keep on writing and have people love my books, really. I've not got any specific target, any specific goal in mind. I want to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, write enough so that I can um, have ho nice holidays. I do like having nice holidays. A couple of those a year and you know that's about it really i just really enjoy it and and meeting some great people readers and other writers which i love i love meeting other people that's great fun um but if i start to find that people aren't enjoying my writing i'll stop mm. oh okay or write something else you know maybe no i'd probably stop i'd probably <laughs> stop if i didn't think people were enjoying it then that would mean that somewhere along the line i'd lost the whatever it was lost the edge and um and then i would stop oh interesting i'm, get, I'm getting old you know I've got a... <laughs> no you're not <laughs> You go to the spa. <laughs> yeah, I go to the spa. And they rejuvenate you. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, that's awesome. And I mean, maybe maybe there'll be an Alderney Writers Festival sometime. Oh, there is. A, there's an Alderney Literary Festival every year. So I'm on the. I'm a trustee of the Alderney Literary Trust, and um, we have one big event each year, which is usually historical. So it's for historical novels, it's fact and and fiction. 
Um, and so that's a great event, really good. And then I think this November we're having some of the, the killer women over for... Um, so you know about the killer women. Yeah. So if the people watching this don't know, this is a team of authors that are based mainly in the south of England and they all write thrillers. So they call themselves the killer women. And they're coming over in November. Some of them are coming over in November to do a murder weekend sort of event. So, <laughs> so yeah, so Alden is a great place for things like that. Full of people who write and paint and, yeah, and I get drunk, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm, it's, I so have to come. Yeah, I so have to come. <laughs> Very welcome. Thank you. Okay, so where can people find you and your books? And, and what is the latest book that everyone should go check out? The latest book is Kill Me Again, and that came out in February. Um, that's available in paperback and it's available obviously for uh, the Kindle um, and you, you should be able to get the paperback in bookshops, you might have to order it because as an independent author it's more difficult to get your books on the bookshelves but they should all be able to order it because it's in the mainstream um, ordering system um, or from Amazon Fantastic, and your website? The website is www.rachel-abbott.com. Fantastic. Thanks so much for your time, Rachel. That was great. Thank you. Nice to talk to you, Joe.